Well, I'm back. And we're going to get started here, so if I can have your attention, then we can uh, get our economy moving by you uh, eating and listening to our speakers and then getting back out there making money. Uh, again, welcome to the Chamber's State of the Economy. Uh, we're very excited to hear economic insights and hear about our outlook from our keynote speakers and panelists. I'd like to now introduce our head table, and if you would, please hold your applause until I introduce everyone. So seated to my far right, your left, Roger Ramsire, immediate past chair of the Tulsa Regional Chamber and vice president and Tulsa market leader for Cox Communications. John Dale, CEO, CEO of Gable Gottwalds, a gold sponsor. Dr. Steve Tiger, CEO and superintendent of Tulsa Tech, a gold sponsor. Tim Lyons, president and CEO of Tulsa uh, TTCU Federal Credit Union, a gold sponsor. Stacy Kimes, executive vice president and CEO elect of BOK Financial, our speaker's sponsor. Seated to my immediate left and your right, Brian Henderson, Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer at BOK Financial and today's keynote speaker. Mike Neal, President and CEO of the Tulsa Regional Chamber. Kevin Gross, President and CEO of Hillcrest Healthcare System and 2022 Chair of the Tulsa Regional Chamber. Arthur Jackson, Senior Vice President of Economic Development at the Tulsa Regional Chamber. Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear, Principal Chief of the Osage Nation. Tara Branson Thomas, Secretary of the Nation and Commerce for the Muscogee Nation. And Trelinia Sherelle Scott, Chief Economist for the Cherokee Nation Businesses. Also, thank, uh, thank you to each of our silver and table sponsors, which are listed on the back of your programs. Now, please join me in thanking all of our sponsors for their support. As we approach year end and look toward 2022, a lot of questions still remain about our economy. We're still dealing with long-term effects of the pandemic, supply chain difficulties, and more. We're honored to have Brian Henderson, Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of BOK Financial, here with us today to discuss some of these impacts on the economy and what we might expect in the year ahead. After we hear from Brian, we'll hear a more regional perspective from our tribal nations. Our tribal partners make significant impacts on the local economy each year, supporting economic development projects, tourism, and more. I'll now welcome Stacy Kimes, Executive Vice President and CEO-elect for BOK Financial to the stage to introduce our keynote speaker. Good afternoon. It's my privilege uh, to introduce our keynote speaker and my colleague, uh, Brian Henderson. Brian Henderson is the Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer for BOK Financial Corporation and is responsible for the Alternative Investments Group, Strategic Investment Advisors, and Kavanaugh Hill Investment Management, Inc. Brian started his career with BOK Financial in 1991 as the head taxable fixed income trader on BOK's institutional trading desk and has since served in various roles within the company. He holds a chartered financial analyst designation as has served as past president and board member for the Oklahoma Society of Financial Analysts. Brian earned a bachelor uh, of business administration and finance degree from Southern Methodist University in Dallas. He is currently an executive board member of the Boy Scouts of America Indian Nation Council in Tulsa. 
Please join me in welcoming Brian Henderson. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stacy. I appreciate that introduction. And uh, thank you again to the chamber for inviting me here this afternoon to share my thoughts on the economy and the markets. Uh, we've certainly come a long way in the, since March of last year when we saw uh, an enormous contraction in, in overall demand. You know, we saw GDP growth collapse by 30%. That's twice as much as the financial crisis that we had to go through back in 08 and 09. My slides today are gonna to bring us up to date and, and speak more about the state of the economy uh, here more recently. And I wanna start off with five main key points of my presentation. The first one being that we were reminded in this past week that COVID still is out there. It's not over. It is still the number one risk to the continued economic expansion. Even prior to this Omicron variant that was just announced right after Thanksgiving, which we're still learning about its impact, we went through, uh, the, you know, Europe had been going through a fourth wave and it already started to institute, you know, more restrictive uh, activities as far as the economy. But certainly the, the, the bigger one that went through the third quarter here in the US, Delta variant, it did pause the economic expansion. We were growing at like six and a half percent in the first half of the year, and the economy slowed down to more like 2%. Most likely, at least in our forecast, you, you, we're, we're probably gonna experience more of these, these variants. This thing does mutate. And as I said with the Omicron, we're, we're learning more about it, but hopefully the, the vaccines are effective at least controlling the spread. The second big thing, my presentation today that I'll provide more details on is that despite the virus, very unusual recession and recovery that we went through. And that is, is that the U.S. consumer is in fine, at least overall, in fantastic financial shape. You, I'm going to share with you things like, you know, net worth figures that support that. It was very unusual that the U.S. consumer at least compared to previous downturns, certainly the financial crisis back in 08 when the consumer was over levered with mortgage debt and credit card debt, that's not was the state of the consumer coming into this pandemic. And now they've made further gains. The third key point of my presentation today is as the economy has reopened, we're, we're experiencing some supply chain disruptions. I mean, we turned the light off, let the economy you know, lie there for several months, flip the light back on, and, and we're experiencing some complications on that. We are experiencing some, something we haven't seen in 20 years, and that's you know, some upward pressure on inflation. And part of that inflation, in my mind, is transitory, is temporary. We'll get through it. It's certainly taking longer uh, to get through some of these supply chain disruptions that are supporting the higher inflation levels, but some of it's not. With as far along in this expansion that we are with the low unemployment rates, wages have already started to uh, tick up. We're already seeing the upward uh, trends in, in, in overall rents here in the United States, and those aren't going away as long as the economy continues to expand. The fourth point is, is that with this higher inflation, the Federal Reserve, which was very key in helping the markets and the economy recover last year, is starting to dial back some of its monetary accommodation. In the first part of uh, just last month in November, the Fed said, hey, we're not ready to start uh, raising interest rates, but we've been expanding our balance sheet by buying government bonds to the tune of about $120 billion a month treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. To, now that we have rates at zero, we're trying to do more. They're going to start dialing back and start slowing down those purchases. They said they started out with a $15 billion reduction this past month in November. They have the flexibility to change that pace, but if they kept that $15 billion pace at, uh, uh, each month, that they would be in, done with uh, expanding their balance sheet by June of next year. The fourth point I have to, to say is that, you know, despite the higher uh, 
inflation levels, the, the, the progress that we've made on uh, recovering from the economy, interest rates remain still very low across from the 0% overnight all the way out to a 140 on a, on a 10 year. And that's supporting upward valuations on all, basically all uh, assets, financial assets in particular. Equity markets, no matter uh, what traditional metric you, you look at on a multiple of earnings or cash flow, stocks are expensive, okay? <clears throat> They've been expensive really over the last year. So far this year, earnings have been so good to help support those uh, overall stock prices. But we still like stocks because our outlook on economic growth is still positive from here. All right, so let's get into some of the numbers. And my first slide is a look at where are we with uh, the vaccination rollout. And, and in, my, in my opinion, we, we've done a pretty good job. 58% uh, of, of our population at the end of October was fully vaccinated. That would include everybody children. And it was just here recently that vaccinations were approved for, for, for children. And that should help uh, continue to increase the rate of overall vaccination levels, which we, which we need in order to get through this. I think we're in better shape, but still it's not high enough. The most important thing, though, if you look at my slide, which will show uh, the percentage of people by age range, and you look at those that are the, the upper age range, those that are 65 years of age and older, they were the most vulnerable. Those were the ones that you know, had a higher probability of having other complications in addition, if they caught COVID, that ended up in the hospital or had real severe cases that uh, the politicians then had to you know, take drastic steps in really clamping down on the overall economy and restricting things. You look and see where we are at the end of October, and those that are 65 years of age and older, at least 80% of them are fully vaccinated. And then through October, almost 90% of those that were 65 years and older at least had one shot. And since October, vaccinations have continued to pick up. Just a couple of days ago, we had like 6 million in, in, in uh, daily vaccinations. And so the, the latest data that I've seen, excluding children, was around 68, 69% of, of the adult population had at least one shot. So we're in much better shape, I think, if, you know, trying to get through these, uh, you know, the Omicron uh, variant and, and any future uh, variant that uh, comes, comes our way. We also, in addition to the vaccinations, firms like Eli Lilly, Merck, uh, uh, Glaxo have also introduce new antivirals that uh, do a decent job of controlling the, uh, the replication of the virus in, in the body. Again, we're, we're in much better shape than where we were a year ago. As far as uh, the trend in case counts, we've got this nice downward trend that's, that started almost right at not, on September 30th, at the beginning of the fourth quarter. But we did experience this fourth wave of the Delta variant, which was highly transmissible. It didn't just happen here. It also uh, was going throughout Asia. And in their particular case, countries like Australia, Malaysia, China, they have this zero COVID policy. Someone gets the, uh, contracts the virus, they clamp down on the economy. It caused a lot of disruptions and was one of the reasons why the economy slowed down as much as it, as it had been. As I said earlier, we were on track the first half of this year, growing more than three times faster than this economy has, had ever, ever grown in the last 25 years at six and a half percent. Then we're clamping, we, we shut down, you know, back to the 2% level. Of course, that six and a half percent was, we opened up the economy. We, we rolled out the vaccines. We also went, provided $900 billion in additional stimulus that went through in December, followed up with another $2 trillion with stimulus checks that got rolled out in the first quarter of 2021. Now, my next slide is, with that rise of the Delta in particular, it had a negative impact on overall confidence levels. The graph that I have here is a, is a consumer confidence index that University of Michigan has run for 40 plus years. And you can see what happened we, after the, you know, when the pandemic hit in March, went down, 
came back up, but when Delta arrived, went right back down. In addition to the concerns about health with the Delta virus, also what's happening is, is, is the other thing that I mentioned, which is new, which is this rise in over and over inflation levels that is negatively impacting, I think, confidence levels. Part of this survey from the University of Michigan on consumer confidence, there were a couple questions in there, like now, was, was now a good time to buy a car? Was now a good time to buy a uh, home? Well, home prices have risen you know, 20% nationally year over year. Even here in the, in, in the Tulsa metro area, home prices have risen around 10%. There's, the supply of homes relative to the sales rate that we're on is very low. So, you know, prices are up. Those survey levels came in very, very low. And the, uh, uh, <clears throat> and impacted, you know, overall, overall growth in, in the third quarter. Now, despite the, the, the lower confidence levels, one of the key points that I shared with you earlier is that the consumer, at least from an overall sense, is in remarkable financial conditions. I've got a graph here of household net worth here in the U.S. Up at $130 trillion. You see, again, that dip in the early part of 2020, but now at record highs. And what's driving that? Well, it's record high, basically, financial asset prices. Those that own a home are enjoying the appreciation and equity that gets built up uh, on household balance sheets. As well, another thing that was unusual about this recovery is that the consumer has been able to, to, to build a lot of savings. There's an estimated $2 trillion sitting in bank and money market accounts held by consumers that are excess savings from the consumer that hasn't been able to, or hasn't been willing to go out and travel, hasn't been willing maybe to get in, in front of a crowd, go to a sporting event, those sorts of things. And why that's important to me when you start thinking about economic growth from here, we're not going to get a, probably another stimulus, we're not going to get another COVID stimulus package next year. So what are the drivers of economic growth? It's back to the consumer. It's back to the, what's been driving our economy for so long. Cons consumption spending accounts for about two-thirds of, of, of our overall economy. At least they're in great financial shape in order to, to, to allow that to happen. Now, the consumer has been, uh, well, I mean, maybe they're not going to a ball game, but they have been on the Internet buying things, durable goods. And you can see that. Here is a graph of personal consumption expenditures on durable goods. Think cars, you know, appliances, sporting goods, uh, electrical, um, you know, cell phones, and, th and that sort of thing. This is this is going back several years, but the big dip is is you saw durable goods spending, you know, collapse from four trillion down to you know close to three and a half trillion. What do what what manufacturers do? What do retailers do? Besides having to lay off people, they cut inventories. You know, they're cutting their orders for new, good, new things. And then lo and behold, the stimulus checks come out, and, and, and we're, in, we're in boom times. And to, today, from that, that low point, now expenditures on durable goods are up over a trillion dollars from the, that low point. It caught a lot of these manufacturers off, off guard were if you were to kind of trend line it and say, hey, how does that trillion dollars more in, in durable goods expenditures, how does that equate to you know, the trend that we are on? 500 billion, it is, uh, demand has not been the, been the issue here, at least in, this, in that part of the uh, economy. It's also been one of the reasons uh, while we've had some supply chain issues is because of all of that excess demand. It's not all of the, the reason for the inflation, but it has contributed to the uh, shortages and, and uh, bottlenecks and elevated inflation that we've experienced. And, and you see it really in the auto sector. Uh, they've been plagued with not being able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, procure the semiconductors, all the microchips in order to increased production of new cars, and so 
new car inventories, you drive around the lots here in Tulsa, you see they're down. Uh, nationally, new car inventories are, you know, 20% 20, uh, 20 of what they were pre-pandemic, used cars even 50%, and collectively, you know, used car prices now up 50% from where they were a year ago. You look at all durable goods and look at the price trends over the last 25 years, durable good prices have been in decline on average about 2.5% per year for the last 25 years. They experience deflation collectively, all durable goods prices. But just in the last year, that spiked up to 8 to 9, 9%. A lot of that being used, used, you know, car prices, used car prices, and so on, uh, and contributing to the overall higher inflation levels. Now, <clears throat> ISM also is a... Uh, uh, association that, that polls manufacturers on various things, overall uh, new orders, uh, prices paid, employment. Another question they ask manufacturers is about supplier deliveries. How long is it taking you from the point that you order some input that you need to manufacture your goods? How long is that taking you to receive that order? And <clears throat> what you see here, the higher numbers is... The, uh, it's taking them longer. My graph's a little, bl little blurry for some reason here, but the number is like around 72, okay? So basically, if you were to look back at that ISM number going back, supplier deliveries, as you, as you probably heard, are, are very slow and, and the slowest that they've been in, 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 uh, in 30 years. It was almost like a perfect storm uh, with what's happened on the, with the ports. We've had trucker shortages for many, many years. Well, that was still the case uh, here in this recovery. Then you had, uh, you know, diff the ports had difficulty, you know, hiring workers to offload a lot of these uh, ships. You had trailers all in the wrong spot. You had Delta also that shut down Asia uh, that caused disrupted uh, various things again contributing to the overall higher higher uh, inflation that we've experienced in the economy and uh, uh, now, now fortunately here more recently something that we're looking at pretty closely to just trying to say hey are, when are we are we seeing some progress here on whether things are getting better and we have seen things uh, it's just been a, a couple months but freight rates for shipping from Asia over here to the ports in the U.S. has started to tick down other things that you see is that uh, a month ago, the number of ships that were waiting to come into the Los Angeles and uh, uh, other ports there in California were, I think it got up to 90 uh, ships that were waiting to come into port and offload their goods. And that has come down to something like 60. So we are making progress. We're, we're certainly not out of the woods. It's still an issue. It's, it's still a uh, you know, adding upward pressure on overall inflation levels, but I think we're on a, hopefully we're on a track to, to uh, imp for improvement from here. Wages. It's another issue uh, that has been new on, uh, at least as far as the overall spike that we're experiencing. Small businesses in particular are really, are really hurting. My graph is, for some reason, not all, the line's not coming all the way to the end. But as far, but you can imagine that small businesses, they're they are positioning themselves to have to raise wages. A lot of it has been on the travel and leisure, hospitality, you know, restaurant se sector. That's where you see the larger uh, wage increases, at least up to this point. But some of the, you know, in, in the in that hospitality sector, wages on a year-over-year -year basis are up there around 15, 20 percent. Collectively, all wages from the uh, labor reports have been growing at about 4.6%. If you were to look at uh, you know, average hourly earnings, those kinds of measures on a year-over-year -year bas basis, that's not too much higher than kind of where it was coming into the uh, pandemic, you know, the last cycle in late 19. It's a little bit higher than, than, uh, uh, than where we were then. Part of the policies that were put in place on emergency unemployment insurance uh, to help those that were out of work and get through the pandemic 
I think some of those also contributed to uh, uh, some of these higher wages <clears throat> that kept many, you know, the lower, the lower wage pay scales, you know, off on the sidelines uh, and, and not reentering the, the workforce. Those all, at least on a national basis, have all expired. We haven't seen a huge significant increase in overall labor force participation, but I think it'll start to improve a little bit as we get further away from these uh, emergency uh, unemployment insurance benefits. The, <clears throat> and, and this labor force participation rate, this is just, you know, of, of, of those that are working age, you know, who all is, you know, in the labor force, who has a job or is looking for a job, it did come down. Uh, during the pandemic, and then when the vaccines were announced and, and got rolled out, it did pick up a little bit. We, we're still a long ways, though, from fully recovering from that lower labor force participation rate. Part of it has been uh, virus-related. There, there is a large percentage of those that aren't ready to start looking for a job yet because they are concerned about this virus. And until we get that under control, that's probably, that situation probably isn't going to get a whole lot better. We've had, with the baby boomers retiring, you know, it's, we've had kind of a natural trend of those that are, you know, reaching retirement age. But during the pandemic and stock prices, financial asset prices rise a lot. Many, there were, there were uh, something like 3 million in early retirements in the last year. Those people most likely aren't coming back for a while either. And uh, so it's going to be an issue... Um, like I said, we've got low unemployment rates. The last number I saw here in, in Tulsa was very low at 2.1%. That, that compares to 4.6% in the United States. And so the supply of labor is low. Wage, wa wa wages are, you know, can continue to rise. Now, what is the outlook for inflation? There are many measures and forecasts that, that get done. Uh, many, you know, they all have their benefits and, and uh, issues with them. But one that I, you know, a standby for me is to look at what's going on in the bond market. There are Treasury inflation protected securities that trade every day uh, throughout the day. It's, it's a fairly liquid market. And you can look at those securities to get a sense of what does the market think is going to be uh, the inflation rate, you know, 10 years out between now and, you know, 10 years out. And that's what I've plotted here is at least the break-even inflation level for these Treasury inflation-protected securities or TIPS. And you see the black line when we started out the year. Inflation was basically kind of what it had been over the last uh, 20 years, around 2%. With the strong growth, with the increase in inflation numbers that we've experienced today, you've seen that pop up, and that's the red line. But thankfully, at least, the trend is down. Yes, uh, the supply chain issues aren't going away right now. They will probably get better. Yes, we've got, you know, 6% CPI inflation today. But I don't expect to use car prices, you know, to go up another 50% and, and keep boosting these uh, overall inflation levels. Could happen, but, but unlikely. Uh, part of the increase in inflation that we've experienced today, too, is uh, the, you know, the higher energy prices. It, it, part of that's just the economy coming back online. WTI started out the year around $45 a barrel. You know, we've, we've come off at the 85, but it's around 68 or so today. You can look at futures on the energy curve. And, and again, there's issues with using that as a, as a forecaster, but it's somewhat of a guide. And, and they're not expecting another doubling in oil prices from here. But as the economy does strengthen, in the supply situation that we are in today, uh, you know, it's our forecast that energy prices are going a little bit higher, but not near to the degree that what we've seen um, so far. And the bond market is also recognizing that as well. I mentioned the Federal Reserve, who you know, cut interest rates to zero and pulled out the playbook from getting us out of the financial crisis from back in 08 and 09, started up this quantitative easing program to provide additional support to the markets and bring longer term interest rates down. What I've plotted here is the uh, uh, Federal Reserve uh, total assets and the, the, the total assets of the Federal Reserve balance sheet are now 
over $8 trillion since the, uh, it's been a more doubling of the overall uh, balance sheet since COVID started in, in March of 2020. They did recognize that we've made a lot of progress in uh, recovering in the labor market. The unemployment rate's gone from basically 15% to the you know, four and a half that we're at today. Uh, inflation levels have certainly exceeded what they thought. And so they're going to start slowing down some of the, uh, the purchases that they're making. They, they, starting out with this $15 billion um, a month reduction, they've pre-advertised this to the market and that it really went off pretty well. It didn't really cause really any too many, too many disruptions at all. In fact, it wasn't you know, a week after that that the S&P 500 had, make an, had made another new high. As far as, uh, as, far as, uh, the, as far as hiking interest rates, the Federal Reserve has changed their framework a little bit, and it was quietly announced back in August, September of last year. And basically what they said is uh, they want to see three things happen before they hike short, their short-term Fed funds rate, which is currently at 0%. They want to see that the economy has reached maximum employment. We started the, uh, you know, in the, in the pandemic, the unemployment rate was at 3.5%. We're at 4.6%. Still have a ways to go. They, they have had trouble over the last 20 years meeting this kind of second mandate that they've set out for themselves to achieve 2% core inflation over time. And... <clears throat> That, that red line on my graph there, there's, for some reason there's a little glitch on showing this, but the, uh, for the last 20 years, most of that red line has been below the, the, the dashed line, which is the 2% range. The, the Fed is adamant about reaching that 2% goal. Well, they're, they're there now. You know, the, the overall core inflation levels that strip out you know, food and energy, that's up at around 4.5%. Four, uh, four but we haven't reached maximum employment level. Uh, yet, and that's not quite defined. Uh, the uh, setting aside some of the early retirements and some of the structural issues that the labor market is going through uh, right now, with many people still on the sidelines and scared about the virus and not entering the job market, um, and, and the, as well as the additional unemployment insurance policies that have sidelined some segments of the labor market. I would say that the, the Fed would have said that the, the maximum unemployment rate would be somewhere below 4%, okay? I'm saying today, because of some of these structural issues that we're dealing with that hopefully get resolved, it could be that <clears throat> the, uh, we don't have to get all the way back down to 3.5% before the Fed actually hikes interest rates. It's our call right now uh, that the Fed isn't gonna hike rates in 2022, that's out of consensus because the bond market, you can just look there, they're pricing in two and a half rate hikes next year. One of the reasons why we don't think the Fed is actually gonna hike rates is one, they have to get through the taper uh, and <clears throat> it's our expectations that the supply chain issues are gonna be in much better shape around the middle of next year that's going to put a lot of downward pressure on, on, on inflation. Yes, wages and rents are going to be there to support uh, you know, us somewhere around 2%, but we're going to, we're, if we get these supply chain issues and the auto sector manufacturers able to ramp up inventories, you're going to see, I don't want to say used car prices are going to fall back to you know, 50%, but even if we give back half of that, it would be a pretty significant drag on overall inflation levels. And that's a big driver on why we're not looking for the rate hike at this point. Another question I get asked uh, is, well, if, if the Federal Reserve, yes, they're not hiking uh, interest rates, but they're you know, slowly reducing their, their monthly bond purchases of you know, $120 billion a month. And uh, who's going to be buying U.S. Treasury securities? Aren't we running big deficits? And we, and we have. The, the tr supply of new treasuries has come to the market, and the market has been able to absorb it. And there's different ways, we don't think it's an issue, and there's several different ways you can look at this. What I've plotted here is the rates of 10-year government securities against the, the rate of a 10-year treasury, and the 10-year treasury being the black, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the red line, the orange line there, at today about 140, 
against some of the of our other major economies that are also running big deficits. Uh, interest rates here in the U.S., while they're low, compared to other developed countries, are relatively high. Our currency also, which would be a factor in, <clears throat> in at least tr attracting investors that are looking at bond markets globally. Hey, if I'm going to buy a 140 on the 10-year, what's going to happen to the U.S. currency? Am I going to you know, lose the gain of going from a negative 30 basis points German uh, Euro bond or a 0% 10-year Japanese bond go into the 10-year bond here in the U.S., am I going to lose it on the currency side? And anyway, our currency has been pretty, pretty strong to offset that. It's not a concern right now. The, uh, the other thing that's amazing to me, too, about this bond market is we have thrown a lot at it, you know, highest inflation rates in 30 years, super strong growth, and we're still sitting at a 140 tenure. That is low. Uh, yes, part of that is probably uh, the Federal Reserve, but it's not all of it. And in fact, you can look at the bond market to give you a sense of well, what is the pace and how high does the bond market pricing in for, far, for future Fed fund uh, rate hikes. And in this cycle, if you can believe this, the bond market has that the Federal Reserve won't be able to raise rates above 2%. It goes from 0% to about 180. That's low, that that's as high as that it would be able to get. You look back in 2018, when the Fed was in a, its last hiking cycle, it only got up, the Fed funds rate only got up to 2.5% before it started causing major problems to the financial markets. We saw a, ver a pretty big slowdown, and the, and the Fed actually had to eventually reverse course. As far as the equity market, it is expensive. I've got uh, the PE multiple kind of plotted over, over time here. Uh, you know, on average, the stock market on a multiple of earnings has been around 16 times. That's kind of been the medium, but we're trading up around 22 times. The strong earnings growth that we've experienced here, plus these low rates, are supporting earnings. And uh, it, the, the, er, the overall economic growth will be key in keeping, in keeping this market uh, supported from here. Thankfully, as, as far as the uh, additional infrastructure package, there are some offsets um, that were announced. We had the $500 billion uh, infrastructure package. The Build Back Better program does have some tax increases, but not near as to the degree that was being talked about earlier this year that would have caused uh, something like a 10% you know, reduction in corporate earnings. Now it's more like a 1% or 2% um, reduction in, in overall earnings here in the, on the S&P, so pretty minimal. This is my last slide, just to kind of wrap it up in summary. <clears throat> we are optimistic on economic growth here for the balance of 21 and 22, setting you know, Omicron and you know, Delta virus case counts off to the side, but we are on pace somewhere to have about a 5% fourth quarter GDP growth, probably continues into the first part of 22 before starting to slow down <clears throat> in, in later in 22, which we get back to more of a trend pace of about 2%. Lots of risk around that, primarily being the COVID situation. On the, fisc on the uh, policy side, uh, the Federal Reserve is going to gradually slow down these asset purchases, probably be done somewhere around the middle of, of uh, next year, at least in our base case. Inflation is the risk there. Hopefully, they're given enough time in order to gradually re reduce those bond purchases on a gradual pace and not have to slam on the brakes with a sudden stop followed by higher rate hikes. On the fiscal side, more of a neutral situation there. A lot of that money, even if the full Biden uh, uh, infrastructure, social infrastructure plan gets passed, uh, it does add to overall economic uh, spending somewhat, but it's spread out over 10 years. It's, it's relatively minimal, maybe 50 basis points of, of overall uh, additions to growth. And again, f finally on the markets, uh, with the economy improving in our forecasts, I, we think that you know, interest rates are going higher. So we're underweighted fixed income assets and favoring things like alternative investments, private equity, real assets, and hedge funds, and, and, and also equities. So thank you very much.
So, Brian, thank you for sharing those insights. I, I often um, think about economic forecasting as a perfect mix of um, science, art, and fortune telling. And so I think today, <laughs> Uh, Brian threw some of that data into his crystal ball, and, and we were the beneficiary of it. So we appreciate you for sharing your perspective today, Brian. Now uh, we're going to take a deeper dive into Northeast Oklahoma's economy, specifically uh, looking at the impact our tribal nations have on uh, the region. Our tribal nations generate billions of dollars each year, support thousands of jobs and are key partners in the Chamber's economic development work that is done through Tulsa's future. So I'm really excited to hear from our three panelists today who I get the pleasure of introducing. Jeffrey Standing Bear is the Principal Chief of Osage Nation. Now in his second term as Principal Chief, he continues the work of protecting and enhancing the Osage culture, language, and lands. Before his election in 2014, Chief Standing Bear practiced law for 34 years. He served as assistant principal chief of the Osage tribe from 1990 through 1994 and was a member of the Osage Nation Congress from 2010 to 2014. Chief Standing Bear has been recognized by Oklahoma Magazine as an Oklahoman of the Year for his leadership of the Osage Nation. He is a graduate of the University of Oklahoma and received his Juris Doctorate degree from the University of Tulsa. Tara Branson Thomas, a citizen of Muscogee Nation, currently serves as Secretary of the Nation and Commerce which is an appointed and confirmed cabinet position responsible for the nation's economic development, intergovernmental relationships, and social welfare policy development. Branson Thomas has more than a decade of experience in government relations, Indian policy, and tribal legislative history. She served as the key point of contact to the nation during the acceptance implementation and reporting for coronavirus relief funding and fiscal recovery funding. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Native American Studies from Dartmouth College and a Master's of Public Policy from Georgetown University. Trelina uh, Cheryl Scott, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, recently stepped into the position of Cherokee Nation businesses chief economist. Prior to assuming her role, she served as treasurer of Cherokee Nation, overseeing the nation's $3 billion annual budget, including the administration of Cherokee Nation's CARES Act and American Rescue Plan funding. Scott has worked for the Cherokee Nation for more than 15 years and has held various positions in gaming, accounting and finance, business development and legal. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in accounting from the University of Notre Dame and a Master's in Taxation and a JD from the University of Tulsa. Today's panel will be moderated by author Jackson, Senior Vice President of Economic Development at the Tulsa Regional Chamber. So now please join me in welcoming Chief Standing Bear, Tara, Trelina, and Arthur to the stage. Thank you, Rose. Well, first off, thank you all for being here. Thank you, panelists, for being here. Uh, this is a little different for us, right? Um, showcasing our, our tribal nations. What we really want to try to capture in this year's state of the economy is the economic impact. Um, Can you hear me? All right. Do I need to start over? Thank you all for being here. Thank you to our panelists. Um, this is a little bit different for everyone uh, in the room. And what we want to do this year uh, for the state of the economy is really capture the uh, value and the tremendous impact that our tribal partners have 
um, on Northeast Oklahoma and the Tulsa region. Uh, we have about four questions, uh, or five questions, about four minutes each uh, per question. And so without further ado, uh, first question. So the road to post-pandemic economic recovery uh, will undoubtedly take a while. Uh, briefly walk us through how you've aided in economic recovery throughout the pandemic. I will toss it to you, Traylon. Okay. See if this comes on. Is this on? Okay. Um, so the Cherokee Nation has taken uh, several steps, which I could talk about for a long time. I'll, I'll hit on the top points that we made here. Uh, so starting back in March of 2020, when sort of it all broke loose, if you will, uh, Chief Oskin made the difficult decision to shut down our businesses. Um, and, and he sent everyone home uh, from the businesses, but also on the government side, he sent everyone home that was over 65 or had the underlying health conditions. And uh, coupled with that, he was adamant that everyone would continue to receive paychecks. So I think everyone at the, both the businesses and the was very proud that nobody missed a paycheck and nobody was laid off during that time. Um, so fast forward then to December of 2020 when the vaccine became available and um, the Cherokee Nation began vaccine clinics throughout the Cherokee Nation Reservation. And to date, we have given over 90,000 doses of the vaccine through our uh, health care system. And that is actually open to uh, citizens because we believe that um, it is imperative that we keep not only our citizens uh, safe, but our neighbors as well. So anybody is eligible to go to any of our health care systems and receive the vaccine, including children ages 5 through 11. Um, in addition to that, we have, uh, let's see, it was in May of this year, uh, Chief Hoskins signed an executive order for our employees, uh, incentivizing them, giving them $300 to, uh, if they would receive the vaccine. And that actually took our vaccine rate of our employees from 30% up to 80%. So Cherokee Nation employees, uh, many of which are sitting at that table right there, uh, our vaccine rate, uh, vaccination rate is at 80% now, so we're very proud of that. Um, and finally, um, in June of 2021, uh, using the American Rescue Plan funds that we received, um, we began making $2,000 um, relief payments to citizens. And to date, we have made over 311,000 payments to citizens, totaling over $622 million. And the majority of those have gone to citizens who live you know, here in Oklahoma. So I think those uh, are big steps towards recovery. That's remarkable. Thank you, Trelina. Well, Tara, I know you all have uh, done a lot as well to uh, even acquiring a hospital uh, in the middle of this pandemic and great work that Secretary Sean Terry has done in the Muskogee Nation. So can you expand a little bit upon that and how that's having an impact? Yeah, I think uh, tribes really led the way during the early parts of the pandemic and recovery and providing uh, support systems in rural communities and uh, not so not just to tribal communities, but to, to rural economies and providing support um, during what was a huge shift for those communities. Uh, I know we all supported um, education efforts to um, bridge the gap for students. So that's one thing I know Cherokee and Creek Nation also made investments in. In addition to the vaccines, we're really proud of um, our healthcare system. They've been working very diligently to provide um, life-saving care in a lot of cases. We own two rural community hospitals prior to the acquisition of the former Cancer Treatment Centers of America, and those two hospitals remained open 24 hours a day. We made uh, renovations to those facilities to be able to support um, low-risk COVID recovery cases. Uh, we transformed entire floors of our community hospitals uh, to be able to provide that support. So um, having those two hospitals in Oak Fusky County and Oak County provided a service uh, where there would not have been beds available in those communities had it not been for our tribal government, both those hospitals were in a position uh, where they would not have existed had it not been for 
um, tribe stepping in and making those adjustments um, and taking over the ownership of those uh, formerly county or municipal operated facilities. So uh, we've definitely continued that track. We have facilities um, in McIntosh County where there's not a hospital um, and expanded emergency care there and provided testing and uh, vaccines. So we've done uh, just over 42,000 vaccine doses uh, here in the Tulsa regional area and continue to distribute all different types of vaccines to whoever's interested. So if you're if you're here today and you haven't been vaccinated or you need a booster, uh, you can head on over to Council Oak and uh, Secretary Terry and his team would definitely be happy to take care of you today. Great work. And you all kept a lot of the uh, former cancer center treatment uh, employees, right? who want to stay in Tulsa. Wow. Yeah, so um, today we have about 100 full-time folks who work in that facility, uh, and they're actually hosting a job fair to uh, bring on additional uh, staff later next week. I have those details, but um, so that'll be next week, and uh, we continue to, as the operations of the facility ramp back up, um, there'll be new positions as that occurs. Major impact. Thank yeah. you, Terry. Chief Standing Bear. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Arthur. And... Uh, Thanks to uh, everyone, the chamber and everyone for having this event. The Osage Nation uh, is one of 39 tribes in the state, and I'm glad to see uh, the state leadership recognize that Oklahoma is fortunate in uh, the tribes being here and recognized by the federal government because we were able to receive CARES Act money and American Rescue Plan Act money where other states did not have that benefit. So we've been uh, putting these billions, actually, into our economy, and uh, we started out uh, internal, as I'll get to in a, in a minute. But let's go back before CARES and before ARPA. Uh, in March, of 2020, um, we quickly learned how serious this was, all of us. And uh, like uh, Cherokee and Muscogee uh, and the leadership of the state, I declared a state of emergency uh, in the Osage Nation. And then we instituted the uh, various protocols in the workplace uh, and uh, home at home work. Uh, which is difficult in the rural areas because of the lack of broadband. Okay, but we're trying to work on that now. Um, and we also um, uh, brought in, of course, our health professionals. And through that time in March and through today, um, I, this is a medical issue, a health issue, and our chief medical officer and all of the staff, the nurses and Everyone that works as providers for health have done just an incredible, remarkable job. Uh, we also, uh, when we started, uh, we found out that we didn't have any vaccines available to us. Uh, we were getting nervous, of course, and uh, we uh, instituted the mask, mask protocols, distancing protocols, and then we started testing. We had plenty of ways to test. So we started making the testing mandatory. Um, now, um, then the vaccines became available. First, it was the Pfizer. And um, about 30 days later, we got the Moderna. Now, the Pfizer, some people, including myself, uh, was not too excited about something to keep that cold for that long, because along the way, no telling what's going to happen. But the assistant chief, Redcorn, uh, went ahead and said, well, I'll go ahead and do the Pfizer. And I'll say, I'll be first up for Moderna. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that. And, um, and as we were able to get more vaccines in, uh, our chief medical officer, the late uh, Dr. Ron Shaw, uh, said, chief, we've got some uh, extra here. And um, he said, I I'd recommend that we um, share that with the local community because we're all interacting uh, anyway. And uh, we followed that advice and our health system and the, and the nurses and everyone started setting up all the apparatus to make that happen. And as we, every week it went by, we were able to grow that activity to where uh, we also have opened it up to everybody, 
race, creed, color, location from another state, whatever. And it's free, and, and we have uh, vaccinated thousands of people. So that medical issue uh, tracked along with our administrative issues and governmental issues and our business issues. Uh, we also were in con uh, constant contact with the uh, leadership of the state and businesses, uh, the chiefs. We, we were talking, uh, all the leaders were talking on a daily basis. And I, I really, I got to congratulate everybody. Uh, we just did, a, everyone just did a great job. Uh, I know a lot of you were uh, working day in, day in, out, didn't miss a day, and working Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, and because I talked to a lot of you on Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> and people kept pushing forward. Um, now, we, uh, we did receive the CARES Act money and the uh, ARPA funds, uh, and that came at the opportune time uh, because of the, um, we, we closed our casinos. Uh, the PPP came through. We accessed all those tools. And, uh, but what happened next is a, um, a lesson in being at the end of the supply chain when we found out we didn't have enough food for our elders or for our children programs. And um, I think I'll be able to tell you all about that in another question. And uh, I'll uh, come back to that. Well, that's great work, great partnership. Thank you, Chief. Um, and you're exactly right, perfect segue. So. One issue that I think we're facing worldwide, and it's um, you know, surprising, I think, to many of us that we're also facing the same situation right here in America, and in particular, Northeast Oklahoma and, and the Tulsa region, but um, it's food insecurity, right? And so I wanna have a chance for, for you all to speak about what you're doing for your, your tribal nations for that and for the region. And um, I know Tara, the Muscogee Nation, has a really big event and announcement coming up tomorrow. So I want to kick this question off uh, with you. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> the food insecurity discussion has been a large part of tribal communities for a long time. Uh, we, many of our communities live in food deserts where the only available grocery store might be a convenience store or um, you know, a small platform um, distribution center. And so uh, it, it became a critical need. You know, we started, when we started to see those market fluctuations and notice uh, that things were missing from the shelves and we weren't really prepared to provide an answer at all as a nation, you know, I think many of us expect and rely on those networks, not just um, as individual consumers, but as governments. And then uh, when we weren't able to procure goods that were necessary for our community members and our citizens, um, it became a serious issue. So we kind of came at it from two approaches. Uh, we became a, a bulk buyer, so we actually purchased um, and became a contender in the market to purchase goods and distribute them ourselves. Um, we did that through a series of events um, last fall. And then more importantly, uh, we made an investment and made a decision that we were going to try and build a more stable regional food network in northeastern Oklahoma so that no matter what market pressures existed, uh, we would be able to respond to those. And I think um, a number of tribes have done that. I know we've all made efforts to do that. So we're positioned to be able to provide a resiliency that would not otherwise exist in this region if tribes did not make those investments. So tomorrow we are um, launching and opening our uh, Loop Square meat processing facility. Uh, we have a grand opening at 10 a.m. tomorrow. If anyone would like to attend, we'd love to have you there. Um, and we're excited about that because it'll be a USDA certified facility. Uh, we already have uh, contracts in place to help the state of Oklahoma um, distribute their goods and um, sort of those small to middle sized providers who do not have access to these services right now because large uh, meat processing facilities closed. Uh, large packers are making lots of money right now off of producers. So there's a clear imbalance in the market. And so tribes are here to provide some support. Uh, we're excited about launching that facility. It will um, employ at least 10 full-time employees annually and produce um, about a million and a half revenue for the first year to two years as the, facil the facility has additional capacity that we won't be using um, initially. And so we anticipate that this could become um, a five to six million dollar uh, project for a community where there are not 
um, jobs available right now. So uh, we're excited about that, and we'd love to have you uh, at the Loop Square Meat Processing Facility opening tomorrow. Thank you, Tara. Trilena? Uh, well, the Cherokee Nation did uh, ver something very similar uh, to what the Muscogee Nation has done. Um, we, too, uh, were faced with similar uh, issues. Um, we have a food distribution program at the Cherokee Nation, and uh, our food is usually procured through the USDA, and there were uh, shortages, particularly with protein and meat. Um, so we became the bulk buyer. We actually use our network that we use through our businesses and our casinos, um, through the uh, Benny Keiths and those type of, of um, suppliers, and we became a bulk buyer as well. Um, and we actually turned one of our, uh, some of our facilities into um, our own food box making. So we had volunteers and, and employees um, making food boxes that we then distributed um, and we put millions of dollars of our own tribal funds into those uh, efforts. And the last count that I got, which this was a, a low number because I haven't got the updated numbers, but we had distributed over 7,000 additional food boxes as of um, January of 2021. So you can imagine how much more we've done since then. Um, but we also went the route of uh, developing our own sustainable um, uh, and self-sufficient food uh, supply chain. So we actually purchased a 4,000 acre um, hunting and fishing reserve in Sequoia County where citizens can go and they can hunt, they can fish, and they can even um, gather uh, there on the hunting and fishing reserve. And that's step one of the food supply chain. Step two would be the, the meat processing plant that we built as well. Um, where we can process deer, uh, pork, and cattle. Um, and then from there, we also uh, put millions of dollars into capital improvements at uh, facilities throughout our reservation for um, food distribution. Um, so we can then take the food that we have either procured or processed and everything, and then we distribute it into the communities at those strategic points throughout our reservation. So we have our own food supply chain. Remarkable, thank you. Chief. So on March 20 of 2020, I'm sitting in my office, director of operations comes in and says, there's no food, no meat. And uh, so we'll you know, find another company to work with and you know we have I wouldn't be here if we hadn't already tried all this and uh, explain what's happening and and like we all especially in the rural areas found out uh, there just simply was no meat available and then other uh, fresh vegetables forget it so we have all the elder programs all the children programs and I and I saw so I told um, Casey it's his name I said well we got 2,000 head of cattle and a hundred head of bison like within 10 miles from here. And he goes, well, Chief, uh, it, they're not USDA uh, processed, et cetera. So right there that day, we learned uh, some lessons and we immediately said, well, if, if it's all jammed up and the staff had already looked at every alternative, then we need to get into the food processing business uh, for meat and fresh vegetables. And so we had been working, like the other tribes, on our food sovereignty initiatives to relieve this uh, lack of healthy food uh, within our communities. But it's been a real struggle. I mean, we have hoop, we had a couple of hoop houses. We had, you know, as I stated, we have our cattle operations. And as we were preparing to uh, just speed everything up, the federal government passed the CARES Act, which was just wonderful. I mean, it's, it's really a a good case of preparation meeting opportunity. So when we did that, we embarked uh, in eight months, we completed this uh, uh, to where today uh, we have a 19,000 square foot meat processing plant in Hominy, Oklahoma, which employs uh, several people. And we're gonna expand that a bit. And uh, we have uh, built a state of the art uh, 20,000 square foot greenhouse I mean, state of the art. I mean, that's in Pahuska. And then we have a 24,000 square foot um, um, uh, food processing and then uh, uh, 12 months out of the year aquaponics farm. 
and we have the people in place in both in all of this and the people were there uh, and the people that were not working for us have been attracted to these activities uh, because uh, the universities Oklahoma State University Kansas State University uh, primarily OSU um, um, have um, and uh, Kansas to a degree University of Missouri have all been uh, uh, working with the tribes in, in small programs that has grown exponentially and then we have these um, uh, uh, food uh, tri intertribal alliances we have all these um, uh, heirloom seed uh, individuals that they're all working together now and uh, and this new generation uh, is doing this. And I tell the, <clears throat> these young, younger attorneys, if you know, back in my day, it was, uh, oh, we got to have, you know, look, look, maybe we could have this activity, and maybe we could have gaming, and we had to go through that, and maybe we could have license tags and all that. Where I'd be now is in the food sovereignty business with the, as, as an attorney, because it's really growing, it's really exciting. That's all the talent coming out of uh, Oklahoma State. Uh, and and, and uh, the career techs, uh, that's where it's at. So we started uh, in, investing heavily into that, and now we can feed ourselves, and, and we can also offer uh, to the community uh, uh, food, um, and uh, profit right now is not our goal. Uh, we want to make sure we are taking care of the people. These are federal funds that we use mostly. We put some of our own money in. Uh, we expect to try to get into the, a different business model after a couple of years, but right now primarily is feed ourselves and feed our community, feed our neighbors, and, and make sure that we are secure in a food supply. So that, that's what we did. Well, thank you, all of you all. Um, I think there's a common theme there. It's not only, I think you're not only addressing the food insecurity, but you're also providing jobs all the facilities that you're opening, so it's remarkable. Yeah, it's got so, to eat, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have time for one last question here. I think this is a really important one, so I'm, I'm glad we're, we're coming uh, up on this one. I don't think a lot of us realize in the room how much of a valued partner our tribal nations are in uh, what in particular my team does uh, under the Tulsa Regional Chamber and, and Tulsa's Future, our regional economic development organization, and helping attract jobs, primary employment, large companies, and industry into our region. And Chief, I want to kick this one off with you as well, because I know we, we just completed a, a very successful site visit, I think maybe end of July or August with a large aerospace company looking at Skyward 36. So, yeah, re well, real yeah. quickly, Arthur, and, and over at the Osage table over there is uh, chairman of our Osage LLC, Frank Freeman. Frank, stand up. Fr hey, Frank. Frank, Frank and his group have uh, been tasked to take an area just uh, west of our Osage casinos, and we are developing it into an aerospace and hopefully uh, more UA uh, uh, drone uh, activity. And we've dedicated that area to, to that kind of business. Uh, the Tulsa uh, Chamber uh, uh, met with us and have been helping us in attracting uh, a business to uh, that, that area. Uh, we uh, will invest and have invested money, and uh, we, uh, it, it's, it's a good partnership. Uh, I can, I don't know, gosh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but um, my dad used to work at Douglas Aircraft out here, which later became Rockwell International, but North American Aviation, then Rockwell, and then you have American Airlines. I mean, the, and, you know, the Gemini project was worked on out here, spacecraft, Apollo. Uh, this was an aerospace town, and to some degree it still is. And we have a lot of aerospace talent here. Uh, I know the chamber recognizes that. We recognize that. And we want to bring that aerospace business back. Uh, uh, we were a leader, Tulsa was, and we can do it again. And the Osage Nation want to be part of it. Thank you, Chief. Well, Traylena, I'm going to toss to you now. I, I think I speak for our uh, partners who I think are still in the room from Mid-America Industrial Park. Raise your hand if you're still here. But uh, a project we can talk a little bit more freely about, uh, Canoe. 
I know you all were very instrumental in helping out and assisting with some workforce stuff and will continue to be. So um, just expand upon not only that, but, you know, the importance of uh, helping us, our regional partners in economic development, attract these uh, large, high-paying jobs to our uh, community. Yeah, so the Cherokee Nation um, has a long history of a partnership with the, with the Tulsa Region Chamber, um, you know, not only with the, with the one you just mentioned, but also, you know, the Macy's, going back a few years with Macy's um, Fulfillment Center, which has brought thousands of jobs. Um, uh, we had the Sofidel um, one that we were involved in as well. Um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was um, really, I think, a, a big partnership that we bring is is our career service and, and, and technical training as well. Um, one of the big things that Cherokee Nation brings to the table is our um, uh, ability to provide job training and on-the-job training, um, which I think is a, is a big benefit and attractor for these companies to come in. Um, you know, just back in October, um, the Cherokee Nation uh, put in another 29 million, committed another 29 million over the next three years for uh, training in, I want to make sure I say this correctly, it was for uh, nursing, HVAC, um, uh, welding, and surgical tech, uh, uh, just to name a few of the, of the tech trades that we're putting millions of dollars in, and those skilled laborers is what are going to tr continue to attract those uh, big companies here. Because when the workforce uh, is here, I think that's what's going to bring the companies here to provide the jobs. So, um, plenty of other things that I could talk about for a long time, but that's one of the ones I'm really proud about is the, the training aspect. That's going to be key moving forward, especially as we continue yeah. to face this labor shortage. So yes. thank you for all your work. Yeah. Well, Tara, I know we have uh, may have not have worked some of these bigger projects, but I know you've been very helpful recently to uh, the Conte Group and Synergents out there in Sepulpa and doing some things there. And we've been in uh, communications on some other things that you have in the works that we can't, not at liberty to talk about. But um, just expand on what that partnership means to you with uh, Tulsa's future and uh, attracting jobs and talent here. Yeah, I think uh, it's critically important. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot um, so far about initiatives that tribes have um, envisioned and then implemented, but really the best products are those that have collaborative partners. And so, you know, when we start to talk about uh, tribes and uh, working in the region, it, we can't do it alone. We, we'd like to. I, I won't be dishonest with you about that. It'd be great to be able to move forward. But our best uh, work comes when we can work together. And we've worked with Cinegens, um to try and, and uh, encourage them uh, to come to Oklahoma and to cite some of their uh, resources here. But more importantly, Conte Group is helping um, sort of revitalize a community that was critically important uh, to Muskogee Creek uh, citizens early on. And we've had kind of a um, transition away from that, uh, that city in, in Sepulpa. And so we've been working with them to just make sure they're prepared. You know, they're providing some of the same services um, initially around hospitality and tourism and trying to bring folks back there. And, and tribes are the best at hospitality and tourism in the region. And so uh, we're trying to lend our support to them to do the training that's necessary for those um, that they need to hire and to really recruit and retain qualified folks uh, to live in those communities and to serve in those communities and those positions. Um, and Conte, when they first came to us, uh, I think they were really kind of thinking about, you know, I need a manager, I need um, sort of their higher level staff, their management staff. And I was like, well, what about young people who we want to keep in our communities. You know, I want, um, when I graduated, I left Oklahoma and ran off to the East Coast for a long time because I felt like I couldn't work here. So how do we find places for those young people? And so, you know, we pour a lot of tribal dollars and, and we bring federal funds in uh, to support um, young people getting career experience here in our communities and testing out a bunch of different things before they run away, you know, somewhere else, maybe just to the other part of the state. But 
Um, and so we encourage them, you know, how can we help place our young people in your hospitality jobs, even if it's just in the summertime? And so they've been really open to that. It's been a really great experience. And so I think those collaborated, our collaborations and um, those opportunities take everyone kind of sitting down at the table and uh, nailing out some details and being committed to that. But, and that's the hard work, right? Everyone else is really motivated after that, but finding those opportunities and synergies is what's really important, particularly from a workforce perspective. And I think it's going to continue to be important as tribes take on these huge broadband projects. Um, we've really invested on the career side in fiber technology and construction and um, those types of things. And so uh, I think, you know, if there's anyone in the room who's looking for opportunities there, it's not just the traditional stuff, hospitality and tourism, but we're looking at larger infrastructure projects over the next five years, all of us, um, by bringing in federal dollars. And so we're going to be looking for those public-private partnerships to make those um, really successful. So that's what I'm kind of excited about. Thank you, Tara. Retaining that talent and keeping it here in Oklahoma, that's probably music to uh, Rue Ramsey's ears there. So, Well, Chief Standing Bear, Tara, Trelina, thank you so much. You all have very important roles in your, your tribal nation, so thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to uh, attend this year's State of the Economy. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, pass it back over to you, Rose, and close us out. Great discussion. Thanks to our panelists and our keynote speaker. We do appreciate all of the insights that you provided uh, today. Before we adjourn, I, I want to remind you that the Chamber's 2022 annual meeting and inauguration will take place Wednesday, January 26th, where we will formally inaugurate Kevin Gross as the 2022 Chamber Chair. Kevin, I see you over there. You can register for this and other upcoming events at TulsaChamber.com. Finally, once again, thanks to all of our generous sponsors who made today's event possible. Please take note of them in the program and call on them as often as possible. Guess what? We're done here, so stay safe and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>